We are going through a series from the book of Daniel on what it means to be involved in society while becoming, while remaining committed to our principles. We, we are calling the series Secular Spiritual Living in a Secular World. And uh, in the first chapter, we looked at Daniel and his three friends, how they uh, had to take on new names uh, because they were part of this uh, uh, society, the, the king of Babylon, um, uh, where, where they were actually, they had gone as exiles after their country lost a war. But now the king was going to use them. But how they chose to be obedient to God. And um, we, we said uh, that um, they decided to be obedient even though it was very difficult for them to do so. Now we come to verse 8 in this passage and see some of the things of their obedience to God uh, even though it was difficult. In verse 8 we are told, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So he took a resolution, he resolved. And this is another important thing about being obedient to God. You have to make firm, clear-cut decisions. You can't stay on the fence. If you stay on the fence, sooner or later, you're going to compromise. If you're not, uh, if you're not willing to clearly state your principles and, and, and uh, so that people know that this, this is the, what you believe, these are your convictions, then uh, un unconsciously you find yourself breaking these convictions. Uh, and, and bakering these principles and going in the wrong direction. You see, if people know what our principles are, they expect us to act differently. Um, two of the most difficult weeks of my life were my first two weeks in university. Uh, I studied at uh, the Kalania University when it was called Vidya Lankara University of Ceylon. And, um, and those first two weeks were terrible because we, we were ragged and we, was, we were always afraid. What are these people going to do to us? And there is a place, uh, this was during the, Viet, uh, the time of the Vietnam War, and there was a house a little uh, past the campus which was called Vietnam, where we would be taken and made to do some uh, humiliating things. Well, everything that I was asked to do, I did. Uh, all the humiliating things. But then one or two things they said that was against my Christian principles. And so I said, please, I can't do that. And one fellow slapped me and said, what are you? Why, why can't you do it? And then I said, my God won't be happy if I do that. Uh, and I don't want to displease my God. And then they had a good laugh and said, here we have an angel who has fallen down from heaven and come to this campus and all of that. And, um, and, uh, and, and they sort of, they had a good laugh at it. But the news went that here's a person who doesn't do some things because of his religious principles. So people began to um, uh, get to realize that I was this kind of person. And of course, I had very good friends, really enjoyed my friends uh, on the campus. But you know, at, at times like uh, at lunchtime, sometimes these friends would uh, uh, tell dirty jokes. And, um, you know, uh, people, and, and they are eating with them, and the jokes are dirty, but they are very funny. So I find myself laughing. Uh, and then sometimes my friends would tell me, hey, hey, Ajit, you can't laugh. You're, you're not supposed to be laughing at these things. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just that because they knew my principles, they expected me to act in a certain way. If they didn't know my principles, then it would have been very easy for me to just slide and do things that go against my convictions as a Christian. So we need to make clear-cut choices and, and stick to them. For example, uh, one of the hardest things that people who are doing jobs have is to separate time to pray and read their Bible. That's very tough because we are, we are living in a very busy world where time is a real problem. Well, uh, so, so a Christian may say, I will spend time with God every day. Now, that is not a very clear-cut thing. A more clear-cut thing would be, I would get up at 6 a.m. in the morning, brush my teeth, wash my face, and spend uh, the next, uh, from 6.15, I will spend time with God. I will put my alarm to get up at 6 o'clock. So this is a clear-cut decision. 
I am going to do this as this is, um, this is necessary for me. Uh, another uh, example, uh, you, you say, I'm going to be a Christian in my job and do my job well as a Christian. Well, Christians do not lie. You cannot lie if you are following God. So, uh, in addition to saying, I will be a Christian in my job, which is a very general thing, you take a more specific thing and you say, I will not tell a lie to make this sale. My boss told me to say that this implement was made in Japan. But I know it's not made in Japan. It's Japanese technology, but it's made in another country. And I'm not going to tell him it was made in Japan. I will tell him it's Japanese technology, but it was made in this other country. And, and so uh, you, you make a decision or there is racist, prejudiced conversation uh, that, that will take place in your workplace, sometimes where they speak in, in ways that are inflammatory against another group of people. And, and you as a Christian, you don't believe in, uh, in isolating people and saying they are bad people and, and, uh, and looking at them negatively. So you say, I will not participate in this conversation. If this type of conversation goes on, I will not uh, do this um, and I will talk about it. Or, uh, there is the whole question of the internet issue uh, where you can waste your time in unedifying, uh, unhelpful sites on the internet. So you make a clear cut decision. I'm going to install some software that will enable me not to uh, go into these sites. I'm going to tell a friend, uh, keep, uh, give him a report every week of the way I behave on the internet. So things like this to help us clear cut decision. Okay, so he made this clear cut decision. Then in verse 8, the second part of eight, eight, verse 8 says how he communicates this clear cut decision. It says, therefore he, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. He made a clear cut decision, but when he communicated it, he did it politely. He did it with all politeness. And of course, we find that God has worked behind the scenes. And uh, the, it so happened that this person liked Daniel. And in verse 9, it says, God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. God had worked oh, in, in, ahead of him uh, to give him some help uh, and to change the attitude of the boss towards uh, Daniel. But for that to work, Daniel had to be polite. And right through the book of Daniel, we find that Daniel was a polite person. And so he was loved by his bosses. Uh, once when the king, Cyrus, um, had to send him to a den of lions. We will look at the story later on. Uh, but when he was sent to the den of lions as a punishment for defying an order of the king according to his principles, uh, the king couldn't sleep all night because he loved Daniel and he didn't want Daniel to die because he loved him. Now, for him to be loved like this, he had to be polite. So Christians must always be polite. People may oppose our principles, uh, but even though they oppose, we are always polite. Uh, in the book of uh, Acts, we are told about how uh, Paul went to Athens and, you know, he saw all these idols and he was provoked within himself. He was very upset to, to see people who are made in the image of God, people made to worship the great God, now instead worshipping idols. He was very upset about this. But we are told that even though he was upset, when he communicated to the people, he reasoned with them. This is Acts 17 uh, verse 16. He reasoned with them. He was upset, but he didn't express the upsetness because Christians must always be polite wherever we are. However people may attack us, we will always be polite. Paul says in 1 uh, Peter 3, 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone 
who gives you a, who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have now he's talking about people who are opposing the gospel who are angry with the, with the christians because of what they are sharing he says be prepared to give an answer to them and then how are we going to do it peter goes on to say do this with gentleness and respect we are gentle and respect one of my colleagues actually the one who took over from me as national director of youth for christ um, uh, his name is Leonard Fernando. When he went to a certain place to start their ministry and put the Youth for Christ board, uh, he had uh, somebody one night who came, he was quite drunk, and he screamed and said, take that board off uh, because we are, going to, uh, we are going to burn this house if you keep that board on. And, um, and he was very violent, talking in very bad language, using profanity, and, the, and this was at, at about 12 o'clock in the night and the neighbors got up and they all went around. He had recently come to this place. So he was really terrified. He and his young wife, they were terrified. And, um, and, um, and there was this huge um, commotion. Well, uh, fortunately, this person le left after some time. And in the morning, uh, my friend, my colleague, Leonard, uh, decided, I want to go and see this person who came and shouted outside my house. So in the morning, he went to the house of this person. And, um, and when he went to the house, his wife said, oh, it's a very good thing that you came. And uh, he was very, a bit surprised by the wife's response. And he said, quick, let me go and call my husband. And the husband came. And he said, oh, I'm so happy that you came. And then he said, you know, I couldn't sleep last night. I was screaming at you, telling terrible things at you, and you were smiling. And when I thought of your smile, I couldn't sleep. Well, what happened was that that person and Leonard became good friends, and, uh, and, they, uh, and, and they became good neighbor, neighbor, neighbors with each other, very friendly. Because in a time of hostility, Leonard acted with politeness. Christians must be polite people. We always respect other people. Whether they, uh, uh, we agree with their principles or not, these are, everybody is a person that we treat with respect. Whether it's our boss, whether it's our subordinate uh, in, in our workplace, everybody we, we treat with respect. Yet, however, um, however respectful we are, not everyone will understand our principles. We don't need to aggravate our opposition by being impolite. But we are polite, but not everyone will understand. So, verse 10 tells us that even though this official liked Daniel and, um, and was favorable towards him, this official said, And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned uh, your food and your drink for why should he see you that you were in a worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. You see, Daniel said, I'm not going to eat the, the food that everyone else eats. So the, the, the boss was afraid. If he doesn't eat this good food, he's going to get thin and look unhealthy. And not only will Daniel be uh, disqualified from his job, the, the official will be killed for not giving him proper food. And so what you find here is when a person follows God's principles, others are concerned, but the concern is misinformed because God called us to a cross. In other words, anybody who follows Christ in this world is going to uh, have a cross is a place of suffering, is going to suffer. They are, because of our principles, we have to suffer. That, is, uh, that goes with being a Christian. But uh, people who love us, when they see us suffering, they get concerned because of their love for us. So we are going to face a misinformed concern when we follow God's way in this world. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a sad thing that a majority of the missionaries who went into the world uh, went with... Um, without their parents being happy because they were going to these countries where things were very difficult from a place of relative ease. And most of the missionaries, their parents were Christians, but they were not happy because they were concerned 
for their children uh, and, and afraid that they will do the wrong thing. Uh, I read the biography of a um, famous American football coach. Uh, he was the coach of uh, the Dallas Cowboys and his name was Tom Landry. He was a legendary co uh, coach. He was there for many, many years and uh, under him, uh, the Dallas Cowboys was one of the top uh, football teams in America. And um, uh, one day, um, there was a new uh, sportsman, a uh, new football player who had joined this team and he heard uh, Tom Landry give a speech to the players. And in this speech, he said, I want you to know my priorities in my life. First, my priority is my relationship with God. That's my first priority. Secondly, I have a responsibility towards my family. So I care for my family. That's my second priority. Third priority is football. Now, Bob Lilly, this new player, thought when he heard that, thought to himself, we'll never win a football match if this is the way our coach thinks. Well, the coach worked very hard at football and they won a lot of matches. And later, Bob Lilly decided that he too would like to be a follower of Jesus Christ and he gave his life to Christ. But when he first heard it, it looked like foolishness. So we must expect that people who love us, who will see the price that we are paying, will finally, will be upset with what we are doing. So don't be disillusioned. Don't be angry with these people. They are angry because they are concerned for us. And so because of that, don't give up. Uh, because your friends, uh, your people who love you, uh, don't understand and don't be disillusioned with them either. Well, we come now to verse 11. What is the answer? Uh, the, uni the, the official says, uh, oh, if you, if you don't eat all this good food, uh, you're going to uh, look bad and I'm going to get into trouble. So then uh, Daniel gives him a wise proposal. And the wise proposal is, verse, ten, uh, verse 11, then Daniel uh, said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned, uh, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So what he's saying is test us. Okay, okay, it's going to be three years. The training is going to be there. Just test us for, uh, for 10 days. And in those 10 days, you look at how we appear. And then you can decide whether you will allow us to do this or not. So, he, uh, verse 14 says that he agreed to allow them to eat this food for 10 days. Now, People, if they are going to be convinced of the truth of something, they need to be, to see it tested. When a person buys a car, they will go on a test drive to see how that car is. And, uh, and it's same with God. If, if, if you're asking people to follow God's principles, they, they, they need a test. They need to know that it's worth following. And who is the test? You and me. We who say we are Christians. You know, sometimes you hear people say, uh, don't look at us, look at Jesus. That's true. We mustn't look at people, we must look at Jesus. But some people don't think Jesus is worth looking at. And so, uh, only by looking at us will they decide as to whether Jesus is worth looking at. And so, they are to look at us. Matthew said in, uh, G Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 16, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We are the test of whether it is worth following God or not. I had a friend from Germany who used to come to Sri Lanka uh, when they were working on one of our dam projects, the Randenigala Dam project. He was a consultant and he would come regularly to negotiate with the government on behalf of the company that was uh, constructing this project. And, um, and this friend, uh, uh, 
there was a Christian meeting uh, in, uh, in his town. And because it was using some unusual technology, uh, this friend uh, went uh, for the meeting and he, um, and he um, went with his wife and, uh, and they, uh, they saw this technology, they saw the meeting and, and all of that. And at the end of the meeting, the, the speaker asked uh, anyone who wants to commit their life to Christ to come forward. And uh, my friend Manfred, he went forward and his wife thought, my goodness, this is the end. All our fun is going to go. My husband is becoming religious. And so she, she didn't oppose it, but she thought, well, we'll wait and see what happens. And this man, Manfred, became a Christian. He, he decided to follow Jesus. His wife observed him. His wife observed him for about two or three years. And after that time, she realized, we are so much happier after my husband became a follower of Christ. True, he doesn't do some of the things he used to do. But those things didn't bring us real happiness. We are so much happier now. And so she became a follower of Christ. We are the test of the gospel. People will look at us and say, is it worth following God? Well, at the end of 10 days, uh, what they found, verse 15 tells us, is that these four young people who didn't eat the food that was given to them were better looking than all the others. Well, what happened was that God had looked after them. They had paid the price and God looked after them. So, we are told in verse 16, And the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now you can just imagine, I remember when my son was a teenager, one of the first questions he would ask is, what's there to eat? When you're a teenager, when you're young, you want to eat. That's the time that you really eat a lot. And here were these four young men with others eating nice food that they like. All they are given is vegetables. If you are putting, putting this into Sri Lankan terminology, it would be, Rice and cabbage one day, next day cabbage and rice. Going on and on and on, eating this kind of food. Not for one week, not for three weeks, not for three months, but for three years. They are told they have to eat this food. And, and this is another aspect of following God. Uh, you, sometimes you may be deprived of things that others uh, have because of your principles. And, 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 and that is, that is uh, uh, difficult. You know, sometimes um, you may go into a vocation because of the call of God. Uh, you may go into a vocation that doesn't give you a good salary. I, I'm very, very, very keen that our young people, when they think of vocation, think of becoming teachers. And especially teachers in villages where there, there aren't good teachers and where there's a shortage of teachers. And so I tell our young people, think of the teaching profession. And when you go to a village, you, the people are so poor, they can't, uh, they can't pay, go for tuition. So you can't make money. But that may be the call of God. So to be poor and to do God's job for you. In 1987, I spoke at a conference called the Urbana Conference for Students in America. And several years after that conference, uh, I met a young person who had been at that conference. And he said, I was at that conference and you were talking about paying the price of serving people. I was a university student. I was studying business. I was planning to go into business, to, to become a very rich person uh, in the executive world. But at that conference, I heard God's call to be an elementary school teacher because the children in America don't have fathers. And, and so, and most of their teachers are women. And they need male models. So I decided to give up my uh, teaching, uh, my, my, uh, my profession as a businessman. And I changed and studied elementary education instead. And now I'm a teacher to little children. How happy I was that this person 
uh, chose this deprivation because of God's call. I, I know other people who are uh, executives in their workplace and they said there were certain things we couldn't do in our workplace. And because of that, we were deprived of promotions. We couldn't do these things, so they, they, we were not given the promotions. But we are happy because we know God is with us. So, so like this, we may have to be deprived sometimes, but actually we are not really deprived because the greatest thing for us is that God is with us. And when God is with us, we are not really deprived. We may look like we are deprived of certain things that people think are essential for a fulfilled life. But real joy is inside. And if a person who's happy inside, how much they may give up outside. If they're happy people, they're happy people. And that's what we can be we can be assured of when God is with us. We know that God loves us, that God is with us. In, in John 10, 10, it says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, have it abundantly. So you may de be deprived of something that somebody considers important. But even though you don't have that, you have a full life. And therefore, you can consider yourself a happy, fulfilled person. Now we come to verse 17. These young people, they, are, they study the language and literature of the Babylonians. But verse 17 tells us that God gave them learning and skill in all literature, wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So what happened was they studied things that they didn't agree with. But we are told that God gave them wisdom. God gave them his perspective on the things that they studied. And that's the way we do our jobs. That's the way we study. We, are, we go and learn our trade. We study business or whatever it is that we are studying. But ultimately, we follow God's principles within the framework that we are called to study or to work. So we need to know the world. We need to know the laws of the land. We need to know what it is to, to, uh, to do the job well. But when we do that job, we follow God's principles. So it's very important for us to look at everything through God's mind. Somebody has called this a Christian mind. We need a biblical mind, in other words, to look at everything that we do from God's perspective. Rec uh, so many years ago, I heard a fairly well-known uh, journalist who, uh, who worked for um, United Press and other top uh, um, international uh, news agencies speaking about how he maintained his faith as a Christian. He said that when he started his profession, he went through the whole Bible looking at everything that the Bible said about truth, because he was handling truth uh, as, a, as a reporter. And he said that study of truth determined the way, the choices that he was going to make as a reporter, so that he would be a Christian reporter. So we are typists. Your job may be a typist, but you're a Christian typist. In other words, you, you do your job as a Christian would do it. So, for example, if you're a typist, you're a pleasant person uh, because Christians are supposed to be pleasant. You, you are concerned for your neighbor uh, and, uh, and, and so you follow that. So God calls us to follow his principles as we go into the world. So today we have looked at certain things uh, about what it means to be involved in society. We must make clear-cut decisions of what is right and wrong. God will work behind the scenes and open doors for us. But on our side, we must be polite in, in the way we talk to people and act. And sometimes, however, people who like us will be concerned when we pay a price for our principles. But we will show that it's worth it because we are the test of the gospel. And then sometimes we may have to give up normal things and look like we are deprived. But God, we are not really deprived because God is with us. And then whatever we do, whatever job we are involved in, we do that job as Christians, according to our Christian principles, within the framework of the job that we are doing. So here, 
are some principles of getting involved in society. So as you go to society, remember, you can be a Christian and, 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 and be a good citizen of your nation and be a good employee of your job.